So uh, despite the presentation title, that's not <laughs> what this is going to be about. So uh, like I mentioned before, it's, it's part of a, a larger project and um, I talked with Subta early this year, which is kind of a survey of machine learning training uh, paradigms, uh, benchmarks, and the, and the relation to thousand brain theory. And it's, <coughs> it's me trying to understand uh, how do we bridge from where we are now in the machine learning aspect and where we should get in the thousand brain theory when, when the thousand brain theory is fully implemented. So I think one uh, key thing to think about is what problem are we trying to solve? And of course, the, the end problem is to generate <coughs> uh, machine intelligence, which, which is similar to what we have in the brain. But there are a lot of intermediate steps which are, are, are not yet clear. How do we put that into a machine learning code? So. I think having intermediate benchmarks might be a good uh, way to go. And that's kind of what we're doing now, right? We have a sparse networks and supervised learning, and now we are moving to few shot and continual learning. And I figure we are continuing to uh, move through that path until we get to, to our end goal. So the title here doesn't reflect today's presentation. It reflects a, a larger project uh, I started working on. So uh, what, how in a, ideal benchmark, what would an ideal benchmark look like? So I think what we want, and then I think this slide, please uh, stop me anytime and correct me if I'm wrong. So this is just uh, uh, my ideas on it. So we want to learn a model of the world from a continuous stream of uh, sensorial input by interacting with an environmental behavior with little supervision or reward signals. Is that a fair um, way to put it, Jeff? So the, I think it's great. Um, I couldn't set it myself better. I don't know about you, Yeah, it looks, it looks good. Um, I mean, I guess you could have some reward, but um, yeah, it I shouldn't it be good. required, though, right? Yeah. It shouldn't be required. You should be able to shouldn't learn. OK. So, so what, what I want to do in this project, so I, I want to break this down into different training paradigms and benchmarks and see how are these problems being addressed in machine learning. And so I wanted to start with the last one, with little supervision or reward signals. And specifically, I wanted to talk about few shot learning because that's the problem we are working right now uh, with the Dendrites project. And there are other ways, and, and I wanna go next into curiosity-based learning, which is kind of the equivalent in the reinforcement learning world of uh, little supervision. But today, I just want to talk about few shot. When you say few shot, you mean a few uh, training samples? Is that what you're saying? Yes, few training yeah. samples in class. And, uh, that's, not clear. that's not clear, by the way, that that fits under the section of little supervision or reward signals. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, uh, I'm just saying it's not clear that belongs there. That's an attribute that applies to, to, to the brain, clearly. Um, I guess you could call it, I mean, because it's not really a supervised, if it's self-supervised, and we think the brain is largely self-supervised, mm -hmm. um, then it's a separate attribute. I, it's fine. I, it's, I think it's a good thing to focus on. I'm just pointing out that I don't necessarily include it under the little supervision. It's it's more of just a self-supervision. Uh, well, it's not, it's just a separate thing, right? It's just a separate thing that we know that. Yeah, but but th those are different. So uh, these are different training paradigms in machine learning. So I understand. I understand. Right. I'm just saying in terms of our world, the four lines above that we just said were great. Uh, I don't think any of them said that that was, uh, you didn't bring out the fact that it's, uh, it requires a few, you know, to, that it's a very rapid learning system. So mm -hmm. it's all right. It's great. It's a separate little element. I guess in some sense, it's kind of implied that if you learn a model of the world with very little supervision, that you, m you should be able to learn new things very quickly. And maybe that, that's when, kind when, of the, when, it's not explicit still, there. Yeah, yeah, it could still be a slower learning system. You could still say, hey, it takes me you know, 20 years to learn how, to, you know, how much you can do something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's a minor point. Let's keep going. <laughs> yeah. It's good. So, so, so the idea behind a few shot learning, at least in machine learning, and uh, I think it's important to mention because when I first saw it, I was also a bit confused that it's not about just learning from a few samples of a class but it's actually learning from a few samples of several classes. And, and the idea is that you're gonna leverage the, the information you get from these other classes. You're gonna learn how to learn 
uh, in a few steps. And you need to leverage this the collective of tests, not just one. So if it was just one class and just a few samples would be a completely different problem than having 50 different classes and like 20 samples per class. So you're including sort of a generalization in this. Is that what you're saying then? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. I would be kind of there. The you're saying in machine learning, they they frame it this way. Yeah, yeah, in machine learning. So so it's, a, it's usually defined as a one-way K-shot classification. And then the N is like the number of classes you have access to, and K is the number of examples per class. So N is never one. And it's always a higher number, like let's say 30, 50, or 100. Uh, oh, 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 you're saying the system has to learn more than one thing. Yeah. Uh, they, it's, not, it's not the same as saying that um, you can learn on five different classes, and then it will uh, generalize to five more, or something like that. Um, well. It's not the same. That would be more, uh, more towards. Um, well, it, it's kind of that, yeah. Well, what I mean, it's not just uh, learning one problem, and you only have those twenty samples, and that's it. Like, you have access to several tasks which belong to the same distribution, and you can leverage yeah. that in order to learn in that particular task. That that's that's kind of where I'm going. So mm -hmm. if you just had one task and 20 samples, that's one problem. But if you have- Well, that's not, that's not really a problem, right? Because then if you only have one class, then your answer is always that class. <laughs> uh, not in one class, sorry, let me rephrase it. If you only had like one task to solve, yeah. and just 20 samples from that task, then that's a different problem. But you have like 10 tasks and the test is similar. Uh, what's implied there is that you can leverage this similarity between tasks in order to learn more. Right, so if you, if you learn how to perform well in one, two, three, four, like in eight tests, that means you can perform well on the last two tests. It's kind of, if you use those tests to learn how to learn with field samples. Okay. Is that a bit more clear? Yeah, it's more of a, it's somewhat of a generalization issue, right? Yeah. 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 So it, it's sort of similar to the intuition, I mean, in biology, I mean, we sort of grow up learning just about the world, all, all sorts of stuff about the world, and then we can learn a new thing very quickly by leveraging what we've learned in the past. Is that, are they trying to get at something like this that by learning by learning a lot of different classes, it's like learning stuff in the background that might be help you in learning something new? Yeah, but not, not just in, in the terms of like transferring a learning, like transferring some parameters, okay. but in terms of learning how to learn from this previous experience you had, like you know a good algorithm of you know how to learn fast. In your mm -hmm. examples. That if I were to translate this into language of the thousand brains theory, I would say maybe something like the following. I would say a column has to uh, discover the right reference frames, motor, motor, and the motor behaviors and the representation of space in the reference frame. And once a column has learned that, it can learn new new structures within that reference frame and movements that can learn very rapidly. Uh, but they're all going to be of the same, a column is going to be restricted to all things that can fit into that reference frame. Um, where if I had to learn something completely different that required a different reference frame, um, then the column would be very slow, it wouldn't do very well. So and that, and some, I'm just trying to train it a little bit more detail the way I would think about it, not the way the machine learning people think about it, but the way I would think about it would be that you've got this, once you've learned a set of objects or a set of structures with, within a, a single column, a many column, those columns now are going to be biased to learn everything in that same structure. And they're going to try to pit, make everything look similar to that or figure out how it works like that. And they wouldn't be very good at other things. But you know, once I've learned three animals, it's, you know, 10 animals, it makes it really easy to learn the, the next 50 because they all have similar types of uh, representational spacing. Mm. Lucas, uh, when I look at that, I, I, I think it, just as stated, it reduces down to learning what's common within the class and what differentiates uh, between the classes. But, you know, so that could devolve down to just not, uh, not to a, a general learning principle, but just to kind of solve that problem. So I'm wondering what you would have to add to that to get to the things like uh, you and, and Jeff were talking about, where there's the potential for generalization from there. Yeah, uh, I think I'm going to get to that in the next. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over some few methods and then maybe. Okay. Have a quick discussion. So, so the way I'm going to, the way it's usually defined in machine learning, it's in, in the context of supervised learning. Uh, you have labels. We don't have a lot, but you have few labels. But it could be easily extended to regression problems or to reinforcement learning 
pro uh, problems or you just have like a few episodes or a few trajectories. And um, I'm just gonna go over very quick over like a few of the main uh, solutions to the problem. And this I got from this, this is a nice uh, review paper, but I'm not gonna do a review of the review paper here. So I'm, if the authors see this video, just forgive me, it's not, it's not gonna be comprehensive. I'm just speaking like a, a few things which I think are interesting. So they propose this taxonomy and uh, they make the point that in order to learn from uh, just a few data, you require some, some prior knowledge, which can be built uh, either into the data. So you can use uh, this prior knowledge to augment the supervised experience. So you, you make the data richer. It can be built into the model. So you reduce the size of the hypothesis space. And that's, um, and we can see that, for example, when you, when, when you restrict the number of parameters you, you update in the model. So you make the model a, a lot more, uh, you make the number of three parameters smaller. So it's uh, easier to learn towards that specific region of the hypothesis space where you think uh, the solution is. Or uh, it can be built into the algorithm and you use this prior knowledge to alter the search for the best hypothesis in the given hypothesis space. And then meta learning is gonna fit in, in this last, last one. And I'm gonna go into detail into each one of this. Just give me a quick second. Okay. So uh, building knowledge, uh, prior knowledge into the data can, for example, transforming samples from the training set. And uh, one example we have is auto augment that can be seen as, as a possible solution. And in auto augment, you learn, use reinforcement learning to learn a set of augmentation policies, which are trained for a specific data set. So the knowledge is being built into those policies that tell you what is the best way to augment your data. So that means if you're using these, you could uh, use a lot less samples and just auto augment those samples to, to increase the size of your data set. Uh, you could also learn like a set of autoencoders that represent this variability. So you, you put the sample throughout these autoencoders and you can generate like 20 different samples which are gonna help you learn the problem. Uh, another way of doing this is transforming samples from like weekly label like we've seen in, uh, in Facebook data set where they get labels from Instagram. And in Instagram, you can have multiple labels for the same image. So they call it like a weekly label. It's not like a dog or a cat. It can be many things at once or just an unlabeled data set. And one way we, uh, of doing this, I think we talked about this before. So you, you can train a, a, a predictor, uh, not actually a predictor, you can train like a generator model and you can filter high confidence samples. You can filter only the, the samples that you have high confidence are of the same class uh, you want to, to train on. So you can use that in order to just increase the size of your data set and, and learn from that. Hey, hey, Lucas, I'm a little confused about how this relates to few shot learning. Is the idea that if you only have a few training examples, you generate a lot of new ones through augmentation? Yeah. And so you're essentially creating a, a bigger training set. Exactly, yeah. Is that, okay. Yeah, like but, I that, but that's not really a few shot learning. That's really just uh, a few data sample learning, right? You'd still, you might still have to do a lot of training on these augmented samples. Yes, yes. So, so these are different solutions to the problem of uh, I only have a few samples. How do I solve that? So one one of the solutions is this. Uh, it's not what we usually know as as few shot learning, machine learning. But like you said, it doesn't mean you you're gonna train. Uh, you're gonna still train as a supervised learning model, but with just a few samples, you can extrapolate to a lot of samples and then you can solve the problem in similar fashion. But um, yeah, you, you're, yeah. Still, you're gonna train for a long time. Yeah. Or, or you can also like transform samples from similar large data sets. And if you're trying to solve a problem, you only have a few samples from this data set, you can find similar ones and then sample based on similarity or you can train again to generate new samples based on that larger data set. So this is what not usually what people know as few shot learning, but it's a, it's a solution to the problem. It's a very like practical solution in some sense. Yeah, it's a practical solution. Yeah. And, and there is a paper that came out, I think a month ago, I was making a lot of noise, I forgot the name. And, and their idea was, was around that same thing, you know, just 
it's learning from few shots, but basically you augment the data in such a way that uh, it makes it very easy to learn from just few shots. Yeah, but it's not it's not algorithmically getting at any sort of uh, core ideas about how to how a system can learn with few examples. It's just getting around the fact that you don't have enough labeled data. Yeah, yeah, it exactly. Yeah, exactly. But I bet this is like what most people do in practice. <laughs> well, it's in, it's, in, the most, in, in it's the most if it's easier to do this and to figure out new ways of creating networks that learn quickly. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I think a lot of companies actually have problems with not enough label data. And so I bet they do a lot of this kind of stuff yeah, yeah. just pragmatically. Yeah. So a second way, and then you, you start getting into the algorithm is you, you actually um, incorporate that knowledge into your model. And there are a few ways of doing that. So one very simple one is just uh, parameter sharing. Like you share uh, some layers or some parameters of your network uh, between different tasks. And uh, I think we, we see a little bit of that in OML where we have this uh, representation network and that representation network is shared between tasks. Uh, or you can do parameter tying as well. You could uh, regularize parameters of different tasks in order to force them to be similar, like penalizing pairwise difference the same way they use in domain transfer. So these are ways of uh, sharing the knowledge between tasks. So you have a bunch of tasks, all those tasks have just a small number of samples, but you're somehow leveraging the fact that these tasks are drawn from the same distribution uh, in order to uh, learn faster. Okay. And this it took from the review paper. So uh, this now I'm getting to the most uh, common models and uh, embedding learning is one of the most common ways of solving uh, two shot learning, where you try to learn an embedding representation, embedding or representation that's gonna make it uh, easier to learn uh, two shot learning. And at that time, you just, you can just measure similarity, oops, sorry, between embeddings from tests and from training samples. And uh, I, I get- I don't really understand what this means, embedding representation. Can you explain that? All right, so embedding is just uh, the latent representation, like you transform your input space into a different uh, latent space. So you, you pass through a bunch of transformations uh, like a neural network. And then at the end, you get this uh, different representation of the input. And the idea is that this different representation is gonna make it easier for downstream tasks like pure shot learning. So this, so this idea says, instead of changing the basic neural network, let's do some pre-processing on the data to get it in a better form so that the later network learns. Is that, is that a correct way of saying it? It's not as actually pre-processing. So I'm gonna explain one of these and my, maybe it makes more clear. So this is a matching net for Nora Vinyas. I think it's a 2016 paper. It, it kind of launched into this new wave of your shot learning. And uh, the idea here is that you have uh, the, the samples from, from the training task, only you have a few samples, and you you have a neural network here, so you're gonna learn an embedding of this test, and, and the goal here, and an embedding of the, the sample you're trying to predict. And the idea here is, this is a attention kernel over these embeddings. And you are constraining the test uh, in such a way that you want to learn a good attention kernel over this uh, representation of the support set. So uh, it's conditional on that. So you are learning both at the same time. You are learning mm -hmm. a good attention kernel, you're learning a good, you're learning a good representation that's gonna help you uh, do this and you're learning like a good attention kernel that's gonna, uh, that will learn how to pay attention to the support set better, like which parts of the support set you want to pay attention to, which parts of the representation. And um, I don't know if that wasn't a good way of explaining it. <laughs> well, it helped. Sorry? It was, it, it made more sense. <laughs> yes. So the idea here, you're conditioning on the support set. And that support set are those uh, only, you only have a few samples. And every new sample you get, you're just going to compare it to all existing samples you have and see which ones are more similar to. So the attention kernel is just, you can think like a, a, just a multiplier. So I'm just going to apply a multiplier to each one of the representations and combine them. And that's going to be my answer. So I'm, I'm conditioning learning to 
through this uh, the support set. And I think in prototypical networks might be even easier to understand. And the idea of prototypical network is just you learn a, a, a prototypical embedding. So you're learning embedding and you mesh them, you combine them, get an average. And when you have a new sample you want to classify, you just, you're just you just going to compare, get a similarity measure, like a distance measure between your new sample and those prototypical embeddings and see which one it's more similar to. And so what you're learning here is this embedding function here, the, the, the function that's going to make the prototypical embedding or the function that's going to uh, convert the support set into a representation. And what you want to learn is like, well, what is a good representation that can be used um, for this task. So the after you you've trained on this new thing, do you do you update your embedded representation or is that just fixed? After no, you, you, after you trained it, it's fixed or is not? No, you update it. So it's is only that a slow process then. I mean, so you've got you've got this new dog on the right there, and and you can quickly train on that dog. But does that update the embedded representation as well at that time, or do you have to separately do that? Yeah. So at inference time, it's fixed. Uh, at training time, you're training both. Uh, and so does that, sorry, does that, does it, is that then, is that training time then still few shot or is there still a lot of training going on? There? It, it's still few shot, but uh, the paradigm here is that you have many tasks and you have many episodes. So you're going to do this thing. So you only have like a few, few shots for this task, but you have many tasks and you're going to do this many, many, many episodes. And you, you get to, to a, a representation, which is good you know, for, for this, uh, type of test, you could say. I was just trying to understand overall, if I would build up a system using this method, would I have saved training time or is it really just, I'm very quickly able to learn a new category, like an inference of a new category, but I still overall the total amount of compute time to train the entire system is still large or not? Yeah, so it, it's still large. So the total amount okay, of so compute time to train, you're not training, you're not reducing training time at all. You're just dealing with the fact that you have a few samples per task. But compute time is too large, we, uh, essentially because you're going to do multiple episodes with multiple tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but here is a, is a task a category? No, the task is uh, the same thing we have in meta learning. Uh, the task is like a few classes, for example. So the task is differentiate between these uh, three classes. And then another task is these three other classes. And, and, and then it goes. So uh, th you can think of it as a category, like say uh, dog breeds within dogs or car brands within cars. You can think of that way. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to go into, I actually had a separate presentation for that. I didn't want to go into the algorithm side because I want to focus on the benchmark, but I did want this to be like more or less clear. And if it's not, maybe I can improve on it and come back later. Yeah, maybe it'll be clearer when you talk about the benchmark, because I'm confused about what, a little bit what they're trying to, how this thing is set up. Not not the algorithm, but the, how the overall, I don't want to say task, but the overall problem, how that's Yeah, so if you're familiar with memo, is the exact same setup. Oh, okay. So you're given, um, in MAML, you're given, you know, a few examples from each class and you're tested to see how well you recognize new examples from those classes. Um, and then you update the whole thing so that the next time around the network is better at doing it. Right. That's the meta learning piece. Right. Um, so yeah. That this, is that kind of similar loop here? Yeah, there's loop, a similar yeah. loop here. So it, you're looping within episodes. So the, the outer yeah. loop, the outer epoch, we call meta epoch, we call episodes. And uh, the idea is, so you're shown a few samples and uh, you're training uh, these two functions here. And the idea is when you show a new sample, you're gonna be able just with an intentional kernel over the support set, you're gonna be able to find what the correct class is, but you're gonna do mm -hmm. this on multiple episodes. And you can, it's the exact same for them as memos, just different solution to it. Okay. Is it still a meta learning thing, would you say, or? Yeah, uh, there's some, uh, there's some discussion about the use of meta learning term in the meta learning paper. <laughs> <on> the <laughs> paper. Um, 
it's still a meta learning thing. Yeah, you could classify as that. And that review I sent on a new link from uh, OpenAI, she classifies as meta learning as well. So you mm -hmm. can it as meta learning. I wouldn't use that term though. Uh, and I'll, I'll just include this for completeness. I didn't go through this paper, but they, they show in the review that another way of doing few shot learning is using generative modeling, um, like based on neural networks of some sort, uh, when ideas just decompose the components and capture the interactions between decomposable uh, components, like a uh, face and nose and ear, like shapes of the object and the target class, or, or doing like group-wise shared priors where you could group data sets into like a hierarchy using unsupervised learning, just clustering them. And then you can decide to share priors between data sets which belong to the same group. And uh, I, I added this reference papers here, but this is all I know of, of that topic. I just added for completeness. And uh, on the algorithm side, so injecting knowledge on the algorithm side, and then memo comes in here, you can uh, choose to refine existing parameters. So you can, for example, fine tuning by regularization, selectively just update some weights, uh, early stopping based on, on validation, or you can refine the meta learner parameter, which is like the memo style. Uh, or you can uh, learn the optimizer. And that I think would be the tool meta learning would come in here. And I don't know if any of you watched the presentation last Friday on the deep learning reading group. And that I was work on that. And this makes more sense to call meta learning because in this case, we're learning the update pool, right? So you're moving from this paradigm where we have like a learning rate uh, apply to the gradient and you use that to update your weights to this new paradigm where you are actually, you have a function and the, the step's gonna be a function of the gradients and the current weights. And that will be the true meta learning, I think in the actual sense. What are you doing in memo is we're learning a better uh, initialization, basically, like a, you, a better starting point for new, when you get a new test. Whereas here you're actually learning like a better update pool. And this is from the learn to learn by grade and descent by grade and descent paper. It's a cool name, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know if it's clear that these are all solving the same problem in a way. Uh, even the data set one, it's solving the problem of I, on, I only have a few samples and what do I do, right? The data set one is solving this. Uh, the embedding learning is solving the same problem and the memo is solving the same problem. So all this, these are three different approaches, but they all solve the same problem. And you could directly compare like memo to matching networks to relational networks. You could use them in the same, uh, the same training paradigm or even the learn to learn by gradient descent. So going to benchmarks. So the benchmark we're using here uh, right now at Momenta is Omniblock. I think Karen did the research topic on this, I won't talk about it too long, but it's basically you have two data sets, uh, background and evaluation. So background, it's, it's 30 alphabets, I think 960 characters, which is about 32 characters per alphabet. And in evaluation, you have 20 alphabets and about 663 characters total. Are those 20 new alphabets? 20 new alphabets, yeah. So in total, it's 50 alphabets. These are disjoint. And, and so we're evaluating not the, uh, the performance, we're evaluating the quickness of learning of those 20 new ones. Exactly, yeah, exactly. We're always on the quickness of learning in new tasks. And for each one of these characters, we have 20 samples per character. So this is what it looks like for like an alphabet. This is a Bengali, this is Sanskrit alphabet. So each one of these, for example, this letter in Sanskrit, we have 20 samples. And, and here is what categorizes this, uh, how machine learning sees few shots. So you can see it's always a bunch of tasks, but only a few samples per task, but it's never just one task. Uh, another one is ImageNet. So in that match networks paper from Vinyals, he defined this uh, mini ImageNet, which is composed of 100 classes. You have a train test eval speed of uh, 16, 4, 16, 20. So hey, hey Lucas, can, can we just, in the previous slide, the Omniglot thing. Um, uh, does this include of like um, you know our alphabet, and would distinguish between 
other similar alphabets. I mean, so like these are, I mean, I don't I have no idea if Bengali and Sanskrit share anything in common. I mean, to me, those are all scribbles, right? Um, but like, you know, if I look at, oh, French versus German, they're pretty similar, you know, some a few accents. So does this, does this data set include those kind of alphabets too? What, I mean, what's in it? If, if they include like the relationship between different alphabets? I'm just saying is like, if, so is there our, is our 26 letter alphabet included as part of this data set? Uh, I'm not sure if our alphabets included, uh, you mean and, and, alphabet, right? Yeah, well, yeah, or, but you know, there's a lot of alphabets that are very, very similar and overlap slightly. And uh, so the question is, are they trying to find alphabets that are very orthogonal with each other? Or are they also including like, oh, we're trying to distinguish between French and German, which are all nearly identical uh, because there's only a few slight differences, you know, a few extra characters here or there. Um, I, I'm just curious if that if that's a, that's like a different problem than trying to decide, you know, you know, Sanskrit versus you know Cyrillic or something. Those are really different. Um, yeah, uh, Sanskrit and Bengali share uh, a lot in common. Uh, I mean, I mean, it looks they're like not, it on the they're not identical, but there's there's a lot of stuff that's shared. Okay, yeah. so then that, that's so that answers my question then. If, if it includes Bengali yeah. and Sanskrit, and these look kind of similar, that's what I was thinking. Like, yeah, I tell like the you could, these, you know, um, you could look at these two. Yeah, they're yeah, very similar. Yeah. Right. So it so that it just it just I don't know what it means. I just want to understand. Are they so now we have these different alphabets that are that and these characters are that overlap? They exist in both they exist in both multiple alphabets. These characters. Um, all right, that's I just want to understand. I don't know what it means yet, but okay. I think the intent is that they're all set different. They're trying to create a data set where everything with uh, lots of categories, but where everything is different, which is well, hard is to do. Clearly, yeah, this is clearly not the case here, right? As yeah. I said, it would be easy to do that if I took three alphabets, you know, the English letters, Bengali and, and Cyrillic, those are all different, really different. And, um, and there's not much overlap at all, but if we're including things like you see here, then there is a lot of overlap, which makes the task quite complex. I'm not even but, sure what it yeah. means anymore. Yeah, so there's no no notion, at least in this data set, of a hierarchy of categories of, of languages. Mm. And uh, and that's a problem. And I think even worse is that in this training paradigm that we have been discussing, uh, we usually only care about the character. And when we define a task, we randomly sample uh, characters from different alphabet. And that notion of, uh, you know, if alphabets are similar or even if the characters belong to the same alphabet, it's usually not taken into account into like a regular a few shot training paradigm. Yeah. Like if it, was, it just gives you an upper bound of the ac classification accuracy that you can get. Mm. It's not, you're never going to get 100%. It's the same in ImageNet. There's some categories that are so similar that humans could not tell them tell them apart. Um, mm. <laughs> well, and there's some there are some images that literally have multiple definitions, right? I, I don't know if it's in ImageNet, but in general, there are things in the world. Oh, definitely in ImageNet, they have that. No. So there is no right, and then you could give a distribution of answers, but um, I, I'm not, all right, enough said. I think I understand the data set, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that, that can still be leveraged, right? Like if you look at how we learn, it's not like we learn, uh, we're learning three different languages, you're not just gonna learn one character of each one at a time, we're gonna learn one language and then another and then another. Yeah, but we also don't look at letters in, in isolation very much, right. um, you know, when, Someone gets in a boat, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, reading Bengali now, and oh, I'm going to be reading English now. There's this whole contextual thing that's going on. Yeah. And, if, and you can very quickly look at even just a single word and say, well, there may be two letters in here that are the same, but the rest of it's very clear what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they're, they're not doing that. They're just looking at one letter at a time, which makes it harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is important. And uh, I'm actually going to get to that point a bit later. And uh, so this, the second data set is ImageNet. And so th the idea here is mini ImageNet is just 100 classes from ImageNet, uh, which are taken from the 1,000 classes in the competition. And you have 600 samples available per class. And the images are downsized. So it's a, it's a bit easier to learn. And uh, one thing here is ImageNet, I, I don't know if you guys know, but it's actually, I think, 8,000 classes total, the data set. And it's taken from a WordNet, which is like an ontology. And you, you actually have in WordNet, you have like as is relations. So you can tell uh, there's actually a, a DAG and the classes are, are within that DAG. And you, you have the distinction of uh, animal and then dog and then dog breed and so on and so forth. 
But in this competition, they just took a thousand classes out of the total image net data set. And those are, I think those are all leaf nodes, right? So they don't have a relation to one another. And they basically disregard that relationship there. So what we know as ImageNet, what we usually refer to as ImageNet, it's those thousand classes, but actually ImageNet is a much larger uh, data set, which uh, it's based on this ontology, so you can have this relationship. And uh, so that there is this other data set, uh, tiered ImageNet, which uh, leverages relationships and you have like uh, 34 high level categories. So it's similar to the alphabet character relationship. Uh, and so you have high level categories and within those categories, you have uh, lower level categories would be like the characters. But it's the same images, exactly the same images. They just have a different sort of ontology on top of them. Yeah, it's not the same as uh, as this one. So this is just 100 classes. These are, are 608 classes total. So it's a uh, larger. But is, it, but is it the same images? And just yeah, they it, have it. The same image. So you have, I, I, sorry, I understand. So I'm just wondering, there's a pile of images. How you label them, can, one, you can have this sort of tiered method. One, you can have this leaf method. Uh, but is it the same set of images? That's actually my question. Yeah, it's the same set of images. Okay. There's a, it's just that the classes they sample. Got it. So here, they're sampling from leaf nodes. And here, they're sampling from like, uh, no. different uh, levels in, in the no. tree, you can no. put it like that. Okay. Now, another one a bit older, with, but was used a lot in the past is the birds data set, the cub. And then these are 200 classes. Uh, you have about 59 samples per class. I made size is about uh, the same as the, the one before. And one thing that's a bit different here than the other data sets is that those are mainly balanced. So you have the same number of samples per class, which makes it for a much easier problem to solve. This starts to get a bit uh, unbalanced. So you have, uh, this is a histogram and you have some, some images, some classes you only have 20 images, some you have 40 like all the way to, well, the average is 60. So I'm guessing the distribution goes way to the right. Lucas, uh, here you show the images are 84 by 84 and an image net two. Are those, are those images um, cropped to be 84 by 84 or are they like distorted so that they fit into a square? It distorted, you know? yeah, they're, uh, well, they're a square anyway, right? Even the original ones are square. They're just down sample. The, the original ones are of 293, 293. They're square. Okay. They're not rectangle. I mean, it's because of that. It's interesting because this picture you're showing here, the image is showing being rectangular, but this yeah. Is not oh, I mean, th these are not squares. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay. I don't know the answer. I don't know the cup data set very well. Maybe they. But for the them. image that data set, they're all square. Perhaps here, there's something else going on. Yeah, the image are all square. Maybe they crop. Also, in these e even in ImageNet, they're actually not all square, but there's like a method to crop and fit them all into a square input size. I mean, in this case, you can look at some of the images you're showing here. Many of them could be reduced because the bird is small or we're occupying a small part of the image. So mm. um, not all of them, but some of them. Yeah, you can even like get just part of the bird. Mm. Yeah. So. So some problems with those uh, data sets, if you're thinking about, you know, I, I want to shop learning to represent uh, human learning. So one is that these are completely balanced or they're fairly balanced data sets. And that's not how real life looks like. So it should vary in terms of uh, number of classes per task. And, and so here, when we're training, we separate classes into tasks, right? So we're training like five classes at a time and we call this a task. And it's always the same number of classes, and it's always the same number of examples per class. And both of these should vary, both in terms of number of classes per task and the number of examples per class, because um, that's, that's how life is. And another issue, and that's actually the biggest issue here, is that the test, testing and training data set are drawn from the same test distribution. And that's like the biggest premise in all those algorithms we have. So we are only ever measuring uh, within data set generalization. Uh, when we actually want models that can generalize to entire new, entire new distributions or data sets. And so these are kind of the two of many issues, especially the second one regarding the data sets we have and the training paradigms we have right now. And, and a third one is that I think Jeff mentioned and we, we ignore the relationship between the classes. And we don't establish, for example, a distinction between characters of different alphabets 
or image belonging to different categories. Uh, what we usually do, we should learn within the same category. So it makes sense that we are learning dog breeds. We're going to learn different dog breeds for dogs and not just mix a dog breed with a cat, with a table, with a chair. That doesn't make a lot of sense for how we learn. And uh, that's, that's one of the issues that these data sets don't address. Uh, some of them have categories, but the algorithms that deal with them, they don't address this. So one, one proposal that came out, I think this last year, I clear, I think that's from a U of T with Google and OpenAI is this uh, meta data set, which is kind of inspiring that CVPR uh, 10 task vision benchmark. And they try to address these main issues. So in here, we have, we have actually a combination of 10 data sets. And uh, so tasks can be composed of these different data sets. It's the same model being learned. So it's not a continuous uh, learning scenario. It's just 10 different data sets mixed. Uh, it's un unbalanced. So for each class, uh, we always sample uh, zero to one. That is a random number from here times 100 images. So it can be all the way from one to 100 images. It, like I said, it's trained on different data sets. So it, these are slightly different distributions. And you, you can, we have things here ranging from traffic signs to birds uh, to characters. So there are very different distributions. And you, you start taking into account the hierarchy as well. So for example, on Omniglot, you sample by uh, category, which means like by alphabet. And on ImageNet, you sample by category instead of just randomly sampling characters which can belong to any alphabet at one time. And uh, so, uh, what I, so what I wanted to show here is the data set names. Uh, I don't wanna go into the, the results here, but it's just comparing different uh, few short learning approaches to this data set. So KNN, we fine tune with matching nets, with MEMO, uh, with uh, relation nets. So these are all, Comparison and then this is a, a version that this paper implements that it's a combination of relation nets and memos and, and bits the previous benchmarks. What what does the word average rank mean? Uh, uh, how do I interpret that number? Average rank is so so they rank their uh, how well they've done in that task compared to the others, and this is the average rank. So so if this algorithm was like the best one in all ten tasks, they would be like one. The average rank would be one. If it, if it would be the worst, the average rank would be oh, I see. six, I see. Six, seven, because there are seven algorithms. So there are seven. So we, these averages should average out to about seven or three and a half or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And uh, just to finish here, uh, few shot, there's a distinction between few shot and continuing few shot. So I didn't go very deep into continuing few shot, which is the problem we're dealing now. And uh, the, the biggest difference is just in few shot, you're just trying, uh, you want to learn how to adapt rapidly to just one new task. Whereas in continuous few shot learning, uh, you're presented like a series of few shot tasks and you validate on a set of samples of all the tasks you've seen in that uh, round. And you want to learn how to adapt to a series of tasks instead of learning how to adapt to one task. So you want to, you want to learn how to do continue learning instead of continue few shot learning instead of just uh, few shot learning. And uh, not necessarily you needed the few shot in the continual learning paradigm. So when you're talking about uh, OML or Animo, I think it's more of a hardware restriction and kind of a coincidence that they set, they use that same few shot paradigm. But if you only want to learn how to do continual learning, you could even take the few shot out of the equation. You can still learn it the same way, but since it's very uh, compute intensive, they ended up using the same uh, Omniglot and the same data sets that are being used in few shot learning. So uh, those are kind of different uh, distinctions. So right now we are doing continuous few shot learning, but we could break this problem and think about just few shot learning and or think about just continuous learning. Those are the I have, a, I have a, a quick, really quick question. Your voice was dropping out for me. It, did it drop out for anyone else or is it my internet connection? Anyone mm -hmm. else have anyone else hear any dropouts? No. no, I didn't okay. hear anything. All right, thank you. I know it's yeah. fine. No. Okay. Well, because it seems to me like there's one kind of big, seems to be a flaw in the way this these things are set up. 
which is that you know we want few shot learning at the end of the day, but that doesn't mean the training has to be few shot. Right. Right. Here they're setting it up so that the training is also always matches kind of what happens when you evaluate the system at the end, but that doesn't have to be the case. Um, I, I'm I'm confused about super type. What's the difference between few shot training versus few shot learning? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a meta thing. So they're setting it up. You, you, at the end of the day, you want a network that can learn new things very quickly. Yes. Right. And so you want, and how you get to that network shouldn't matter. Like we, you know, the, with humans, you know, we're exploring our environment. We do a huge amount of learning. And then when you show me a new car, I can learn it really quickly or a new coffee mug or something like that. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of the the learning that happens up up to the point where you're now doing this few shot learning stuff. Okay. So does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, there's I understand like two what you're levels saying. of learning here. Yeah, um, yeah. And you're using which word for which? <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't being very specific. Okay. Um All right, I get uh, the idea. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know what word. This, this goes back to my I, my point earlier about like, hey, we have to learn the reference frames and just slow. Yeah, but once you've right. done that, then you can learn new things within those reference range very quickly. Um, Symbol of that idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we could go through 20 years of our life, and then uh, when we're 20 years old, be learning new things really, really quickly. Yeah, but, on the assumption that new but, things have some statistical or, uh, you know, they have some relationship to things we've learned in the past. Yeah, but the, but the 20 years of learning doesn't have to be few shot learning all the time. It could be just very intense learning of learning the environment and structure of the environment and moving yeah, around and yeah, all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, so we here learned they formulated it so that the initial part also has to be few shot learning, which seems to me mm -hmm. like you're just handicapping the system. Like, why does it have to be few shot learning all the way through? Right. All we care about is at the end of the day, you can learn things very quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, I agree. And I think GPT-3 is an example of it. And yeah, yeah, like exactly. We have we have to inject prior knowledge somewhere, right? And what GPT-3 we're doing is injecting in the model, it's in the parameters. And when you, you have a new task and then you're gonna, you can, for example, just update a few, few of the parameters, you can just update the last layer, like uh, what we usually call a transfer learning, machine learning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to Whereas be. this seems to be a much harder task that they're setting themselves up for. Yeah. In sense. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, this, uh, this is actually what I had. So uh, there's this paper that came out. I, I just found it last night. So I just quickly skim it. Don't, don't want to go into details, but just point out there's this distinction. And there are people now thinking about this continual few shot problem, which is a different problem than few shot. And uh, I, I kind of wanted to go over this and highlight because we've been talking about free shot and all. And uh, I think we should keep in mind other approaches to the same problem, like we discussed here. Uh, algorithms approach, like learning the optimizer, or like embedding learning approaches. And those that might give us some insights on, on, on how to solve it or, or even what, what should we compare our approach against, right? And uh, at the end of the day, but I actually wanted to go through. so. This is one thing, but also the benchmarks. And uh, like I said, this is like a series of meetings that we want to uh, do that present some of the benchmarks we have in machine learning. So you can see what we have now, and then you can mm -hmm. <laughs> judge and see whether it's fit or not, uh, or, or how we can incorporate that when we, we come up with our own benchmark, or, uh, or if we ever decide to use one of the existing benchmarks. So this is kind of what we have in the field right now. This is, would be the state of the art. A few shot is right. <laughs> metadata set. And of course, there's no behavior in any of these things. No, not at all. Right. Zero. Is there just Although you could solve the problem with behavior, you know, it's sort of an outer loop issue that that you could still fit into these these benchmarks. Um, you know, an attentive the uh, in the human sense, the word attended a different part of the image to build up the structure of the, of the object. Um, um, mm -hmm. So, so you could fit some sort of behavioral characteristics, part of a behavioral character, an attentive sort of component into these benchmarks. But 
other more um, other components like, oh, I'm rotate, I'm looking at something, I'm rotating it, or I'm touching something and moving my finger that doesn't fit into these things at all. Yeah. So the, the, this model is here for our, I didn't go into this papers uh, here, but what I understood is that what they, they capture is like this uh, graph graph approach of, uh, I, I get an image and I just identify which objects are there and I map objects to categories. So if it has a nose, it has an ear, it has a mouth, then it's a face. And uh, that, that might be a bit more similar to uh, the approach that we have been uh, discussing here and that we think the brain it's more, it's more related to how the brain would learn. But maybe this is a nice paper to go through. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Thanks. I have a, I have a few comments to make on this. Just a, it was a great presentation, by the way. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, you know, it, it, we have a, a challenging task in front of us here, and it's similar to what we've been doing in sparsity, right? So. We're trying to take something we've learned about the brain, sparse activation, sparse connectivity, and first we're applying it to existing uh, convolutional neural networks, existing models, and we're trying to shoehorn what we've learned about that into these models and trying to do, trying to do good. But ideally, we want to go away from that, right? We want to go extremely sparse, and therefore we have to go to much uh, uh, wider models, if you will, right? So that's that's where we want to go. But we have to initially show, hey, this works in existing models, but we really know we have to go someplace else. The same issue we face here, right? We would say, oh, maybe we can apply some of our, uh, what we've learned about um, two-shot learning um, it, to these existing models, but maybe in the end, we have to go to something else to really take advantage of it, like super tight suggested, you know, models with movement and so on, that these guys don't talk about at all. So we have that interesting challenge ahead of us there as well. And I, I also want to point out that we know at least two of the major components of the solution to how brains do this. And, and I'm just going to encourage you, if we think about how we're going, we should keep those two components in mind all the time. And, and I'm, this is repetitive. You all know, you should know this. We've talked about it a lot. One is the issue of using, you know, dendritic computation as a way of, of solving the sort of catastrophic learning problem. Um, and that requires us to settle these large convolutional neural networks very slowly um, because that's, that's the only way you get the answer. And the other is this whole idea of uh, reference frames and, atten and attention to so you're actually building models of, uh, in a reference frame. And therefore, you can all you have to learn is the relative positions of a few components, um, and you basically got the, that a model. Um, and so those are the two things we at least we have identified so far. And we just have to make sure we're moving in that direction <laughs> as opposed to saying, here's another thing we could try. Here's another thing we can try. Um, uh, so anyway, I hope that was, uh, if that wasn't clear, let me know. Yeah, I think at least for me it's clear. Uh, what we've been working now is the dendrite part and the catastrophic forgetting. Yeah. yeah. Which I know, so that, that's the first thing to tackle. Uh, I, think, I think Niels is trying to work on the second part. I'm not sure exactly. Components that he's working on, but we need to get there eventually. And I, you know, we're starting to think about the infrastructure for reference frames and so on. But that's the movement with reference frames is the real is one of the, the key core components of how we learn quickly. But it also requires the, the dendritic um, uh, computation and, and, the, and the separation out of problems into these uh, different dendritic branches. Mm -hmm. so it's a, you know, it's a challenge for us, you know, but it's, um, we, this is what we have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what I want to go over next is the curiosity-based learning. Oh, I thought you were done. <laughs> no, no okay. not today. I'm done for today yet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. But next, I want to talk about curiosity-based learning, and uh, I think you remember Vivian's presentation. And um, it's, it's, it's in an environment, it's getting uh, sensory input, it's learning through behavior, and it's learning with no supervision. So I think it's somewhat closer to what we're looking for. And uh, maybe we can get some insights there. I just wanna go, next I wanna go some of the, go over some of the work here. But, but isn't curiosity a, a, a reward signal? It's a, uh, we, we call it implicit motivation. So it's a self-generated reward signal, which is, you, you create a reward signal for yourself based on how uh, different it is from some from everything you've seen before. That's why it's called curiosity. 
Right. If it plays around, saying something's different than what you've seen before, that the brain's making a prediction about what it's going to see, and it's not, it's, the prediction's not working. You know, so right. I see a bird, and I say, hey, these two parts of the bird look like a crow, and then I go over here, and I'm like, oh, that tail doesn't look like a crow, so that's a, whoa, oh, something's wrong here. Um, but there's got to be a motivation to care about that. Well, I think that's in the human brain, it's, uh, it's built in. It just, it's, it's automatic. If you have a misprediction, uh, it, that's built in, it's, part, it's just part of the fabric of the brain. A misprediction says, attend to it and rebuild, you know, fix that part of the model. You don't really have a choice in the matter. You know, some, you're, if you're just touching something or looking at something and there's an error, you just, you, it's automatic, you attend to it. And that's, that's the process right there. Yeah, it's just a the self repairing modeling system that based on prediction. Yeah, in reinforcement learning, for example, you can think of, for example, you have a robotic arm and then it has like some degrees of freedom of what it can do, like it can push, it can grasp. Uh, and you have this arm and you have like a bunch of toys, like objects. And what curiosity based learning in that context means, for, for example, is you're always trying to explore regions of the state action space and you haven't explored yet. So the arm is just going to set itself a goal, like, oh, I'm just going to try and kick the red block to the corner. And then it's just going to try to learn that. And then, oh, I'm just going to try and, and grab the green triangle. And then it's going to try to learn that. And the way it defines this, um, it looks for regions of the state action space that it has low exploration, so it doesn't know yet how to do. So it's just going to learn, just to know. You know just I mean, clearly we do that to some extent in life, but it's a very dangerous thing to do in general. Um, you know, especially uh, once you've reached, you know, adulthood in some sense. You know, a child can try try sticking its finger into an electrical socket and do various other things. Um, but um, but a uh, uh, you know, once we've learned about the world, we don't, we don't try all, the, you know, I don't get in my car today and say, hey, what would happen if I turned the wheel all the way to the left and hit the accelerator and, you know, try to shift at the same time? Well, that's a curiosity based learning, but I, I'm not going to do that. I know something about this enough at this point in time, but a child, you could argue, does do that. You know, a child just tries everything. <laughs> it doesn't know any difference. Oh, maybe, maybe there are some constraints there. Like, oh, I still want to know what happens. I just don't do it because I have a feeling that I might die, but I still want to know, you know, like, don't you get on the, uh, like, on a cliff, on the edge of a cliff, and you think, whoa, what would happen if I jump? I, I don't know if that's the same thing. I mean, I know what would happen if I jump. The, the, the idea that, like, hey, I can just kill myself right now, it may not be the same thing as curiosity-based learning. Like, I'm not really sure. <laughs> you know, it would be fun to find out. I, I don't know. I, I, I think we can't, we can over overanalyze this. I, I, I'm just pointing out that, uh, um, it, curiosity of trying unexplored areas of sensory motor space is certainly something we do, but it's it's certainly something we wouldn't want to do with abandon, and um, it, it needs to be tempered. And um, you know, and, and as you as you mature, it's clear that you can you do less of that. You know, the older you get, the fewer op, the fewer you know risks you take in life. Generally, not for everybody, but in general. Um, yeah. So it's it just a, it's a method that I would agree with, but I just think you have to be. It has, it's not. It, it's more subtle than just like, hey, try try exploring everything. You have to balance the uh, curiosity with punishments. So, yeah, yeah, and expectations. I mean, clearly, what we're doing is we're learning what's likely to happen, and uh, and based on and, and as you get you know as you get older, more and more you think like, I think I know what's going to happen here. I'm not going to try this. I think I know what's going to happen. Here. When you're younger, you say. I'm not sure. What the hell? Right now, you know, um, it just we just mature that way. Anyway, it's uh, it's a good it's a good method, I think. I'm not I'm not dissing 